So, uh, hi, my name is Nikhil Patel. Uh, Rohan. This is Rohan Patel, yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, we're working in Dr. Erlbacher's lab with uh, two grad students that have been really helpful, um, Brian and Juan. Uh, they've kind of, with Dr. Erlbacher, taken us through this whole process and we've learned a lot. Um, our main project is really centered around analyzing emotion with artificial neural networks, and I guess we'll kind of find out what that means in the next eight minutes. So uh, first, to give you some background on what you're doing, uh, there's a tool out there called an electroencephalogram, or EEG, which is uh, basically just kind of a brain scan. It picks up electrical data from your brain and allows you to kind of record the patterns and uh, waves that, that uh, from your brain. You can then use those in a variety of different ways to, uh, to kind of understand what someone's thinking about. What we were trying to do is develop tools, develop uh, some computer programs that can take in all of these EEG signals that can take in all of these electrical outputs and actually do something useful with them, actually take them and predict what someone's thinking or doing based on those patterns. And the end goal is really to create something that you can use in a variety of situations, whether it be video games, virtual reality, any kind of human computer interface you could think of. So, um, we use a device called the Motive Epoch for our research. Uh, there are 14 nodes on the epoch that uh, collect 14 different kinds of brain signals. Um, after doing a little bit of literature review, we found that there were four signals that were especially important to recognizing emotion and um, variati variations of emotion in the brain. And uh, we perform uh, seven different trials. So our grad student mentor, Brian, was our test subject for this. And we had him sit, we had him watch a horror scene, uh, focus with his eyes closed, look at a blank wall, watch an action scene, uh, watch like a peaceful fireplace or solve a Rubik's cube. And then we also had him doing a little bit of physical interaction, um, juggling tennis balls. And if you look on the right side, those are um, the graphs of the signals we obtain. Um, the top one being the waves from the focus signal, and the bottom one being the four waves from the scare signals. And um, we experimented with the first four since we found those were uh, substantially important. And we also experimented with other combinations and see how that affected the network. So one of our biggest challenges and something we're still working on um, now is kind of getting our data to a point where you can actually input it into our system and do something with it. So what we started with is just binary classification. Like Rohan mentioned, we took those scared signals and those focus signals, and we tried to see if uh, we could get something to predict which signal is which. So each of the waves we've collected basically has about 11,000 points. Uh, the system we use uh, collects about 120 points every second. And so for two minutes, we have about 11,000. We then split those into segments of 50 points called uh, sequences. And assigned each one of those, uh, each one of those uh, sequences a label zero or one, like from the last slide, uh, scared or focused, and took them in, split them into two different groups, a training group and a testing group, basically so that we could uh, both teach our model how to predict uh, whether someone was scared or focused, and then to test it and see if it actually worked. All right, so uh, we implemented a neural network to process this data. Um, a neural network is basically a computer simulation inspired by uh, processing of a brain. So similar to how a brain functions, it uh, takes the external data, it processes it, um, recognizes patterns and uh, variations that it sees in the data. And then when future input is processed through the network, is able to make uh, predictions based on the data. Um, all networks consist of neurons. Um, they can range from simple networks to large uh, intertwining uh, complex networks. Um, they have different um, functions called activation functions. They're able to take individual pieces of data and process and filter them. And they use something called weights. So each strand you see on this diagram has a different weight, which is sort of like an importance for the data that is processed through there that is used to make its future prediction. Um, and as this simulation, as this uh, artificial neural network is run, uh, it uses a method called backpropagation to 
update its weights and minimize its loss against its prediction of the outcome of the data. So after each, um, you'll see later it's called an epoch, each run of the net network, uh, it takes its accuracy and um, changes the weights to make the accuracy uh, more efficient and um, minimize the loss against the actual data that's there. So neural networks are just one form of uh, attempted artificial intelligence. And within the category of neural networks, there are a lot of kind of subfields. Uh, you have things like feed-forward networks, where you literally just take a piece of data and pass it through a bunch of neurons. Or you have uh, things like recurrent networks, which is what we were using here. Now, the advantage of a recurrent network is that it kind of allows you to incorporate a sense of memory, a sense of kind of time. And uh, what we focus on specifically is an LSTM, or Long Short-Term Memory Network, which allows you to take in a large stream of data, like the uh, kind of brain waves we collected, and recognize patterns in that data. So an LSTM is kind of a very, it, it's a special kind of neural network, uh, and each node looks kind of like that over there. And basically, it, kind of the, way, the easiest way to imagine it is that an LSTM node kind of has a lot of smaller nodes inside of it. Uh, those are what all those little circles are. And I can talk more about how each one of those works later. But what happens is you pass information in, and uh, your LSTM node will look at previous information and try to see how important this inf your current information is in retrospect, all that stuff. It's kind of confusing. But what it allows you to do is incorporate both memory and time components, which uh, kind of gives you that it gives you perspective on each new point of data that you get. Um, so after processing the data, we found that um, running it 100 times, uh, the accuracy with four <coughs> signals was almost random. It was about 50%. And we later realized that uh, previously, like when we were first running the simulation, the signals were out of order. And this was giving us a faulty accuracy of about 88%. So what it was basically doing is, say if we had signal 3 from um, each trial, it would compare signal 3 with signal 5. And it would compare signal 4 with signal 1. Um, and when you do this, you get a big difference in uh, the predictions that the network is trying to make. So it thinks that uh, what it sees there is the actual difference when um, the actual difference is much smaller. So uh, when the shuffle signals were compared, it arose to about 88%. And currently, we're trying to um, filter the data in such a way that the network is um, able to more efficiently recognize the patterns it sees in the brain waves. So yeah, like uh, Rohan said, this actually happened um, last Thursday, we were pretty happy with that 88% <laughs> accuracy we were getting. Um, and going through the code, we uh, noticed that uh, we were doing it wrong. So uh, <laughs> what we're working on doing now is kind of fixing that, right? Doing a lot of data processing. Um, just now, uh, our grad students had the idea of uh, normalizing our data around zero to see if we can uh, get better uh, get better classification based on that. We'll uh, use different signals, all sorts, all sorts of stuff, to try to get that accuracy back up to where we had it. We're also working on um, kind of incorporating a, a variety of different inputs. Uh, what we talked about was the focused and scared signals that we compared. But uh, as Rohan mentioned, we collected uh, seven total signals. We had juggling, Ruby, Steve, all of that stuff. And what we're working on doing now is putting those all together and seeing if uh, it is possible to classify correctly even when you have seven different types of signals. We're also using different combinations of those 14 nodes to uh, see if we can get over the problem of that 50% accuracy. So kind of in conclusion, uh, what we've been working on developing, what hopefully we'll have done by the end of these six weeks, is something that you can use to accurately identify what someone is thinking about and that you can then use in a variety of situations in any HCI you could think of, uh, whether it be interacting with a computer, phone, uh, playing a video game, or walking around in a virtual reality environment. So uh, thank you all for listening. I hope we taught you something, I guess. Um, if you have any questions.
question. Uh, did you do any kind of alignment, or how did you synchronize these these uh, series that you had? Uh, yeah. So what we did is there were, um, like we were saying, there was four report signals that we took from each trial. So um, say if you had a three-dimensional grid, we were able to take uh, one signal and make it one layer, and take the f second signal and make it a second layer, and then do the same for the next two, so that you have kind of like a three-dimensional grid of um, a third dimension that's uh, four units. And then what we did is we did that for the focus data, and for the scare data, we also did that, and we st like collated the data into one three-dimensional grid, and we shuffled it so the network could read it through at once. Any other questions? Thank you very much.